Uh, order, order. Welcome to this hearing of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee subcommittee uh, looking at the UK government's support of education in the overseas territories. We're really grateful to you, Minister, for joining us. We know this isn't your usual committee, um, so we do appreciate you taking the time. And we're delighted that we're joined by Becky Richards from the Foreign Office, and we will shortly be joined by Philippa from the Home Office so that we have a comprehensive cross government response uh, where we're able to deal with everything. Uh, Minister, just to kick off, what are the responsibilities um, as the UK government sees it towards education? Education on the overseas territories and to our British family. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Well, there's a number of ways that we support delivery of education in the overseas territories. Um, it's been a, fair to say it's been a bit of an evolving package over the last 10-15 um, years or so. Um, first of all, we had the introduction of the home fee status back in 2007-2008. We've had the more recent introduction of the uh, uh, eligibility for tuition fee loans in 22. Uh, 23, which our department has been very closely involved in. Um, we support with the scholarship schemes, the Turing scheme, the Shevening schemes. Um, we also support with um, uh, direct practitioner to practitioner support, so sort of peer to peer support, training and advice, for example. Um, and are involved with FCDO colleagues in the um, uh, ODA support as well. So, a sort of comprehensive range of, um, of measures that we take to um, support overseas territories um, and work close with other departments like the Home Office and FCDO on that. Right. And in terms of obviously, there are three overseas territories that don't have access to higher education: so the Falklands, Pitcairn, uh, St Helena, Ascension, and then Tristan da Cunha. Um, how do we assess we're meeting our obligations under Article 73 of the UN Charter? Because obviously, whilst education sits with the overseas territory themselves, who obviously have their own education ministers, we do have that requirement to make sure that education is being provided at an adequate level. Yes, absolutely. And I suppose the answer is sort of slightly different depending on the overseas territories themselves. Um, in some places, there are, um, you know, th th through, through ODA eligible territories, um, support schemes that could be through uh, maintenance um, schemes or um, uh, loan schemes, for example. And in some others, it's, to, it's about um, providing you know, advice and expertise to make sure people you know, have, have the, the, um, the ability to um, access higher education. Um, so if you look at how closely we work with, for example, the Falkland Islands, um, they have uh, schemes that uh, allow £22,000 a year grants to individuals looking to study um, in higher education, um, both undergraduate and postgraduate. I think it's £22,000 a year for um, uh, both undergrads and postgrads, with some slight changes to the um, postgrad um, schemes, some extra conditions. So it's, it, it does depend on the overseas territory themselves, um, but again, it comes back to that sort of range of options that we have available through um, uh, fee loan support, ODA support, um, uh, scholarship schemes, um, ODA support where applicable, um, and also I think pr probably crucially just invest, investment in the capacity in some of those places as well. So in ODA eligible um, territories particularly, where we invest in um, uh, primary, secondary school education, um, and the wider sort of digital capacity too, to make sure people have that that type of access. So, so it is bespoke, depending on the requests of the overseas territory and the type of need that they have. And can I ask, in terms of and welcome, Philip, apologies, no, no, it's not Sorry. your fault at all. No, please welcome. You're very much welcome. Um, in terms of the rhythm of engagement between your officials and department, uh, essentially education ministers in the OTs. What is the rhythm of that engagement and what oversight are you given of whether that is appropriate and whether it's taking place at an appropriate period? Thank you, absolutely. Um, I think the, the very regular engagement is often from um, FCDO directly with um, the overseas territories um, for, for, and then DFE in, um, uh, certainly at ministerial level and official level where required to. Um, there are sort of uh, the, the regular drumbeat of engagement from FCDO and others with the overseas territories, I mean, particularly in the ODA eligible territories, so they have monthly conversations about spending, for example, um, and particularly in areas like um, uh, Montserrat, Pitcairn, uh, St Helena, they have annual delegations and missions where foreign, foreign office officials uh, spend time uh, on location talking about educational delivery. In terms of DFE, uh, we also meet at ministerial level as well, so um, every government department now has an overseas territory minister. I'm the overseas territory minister in DFE. Um, previously, it was the previous minister of state for schools who met regularly with um, overseas territory ministers. We always accept requests as a matter of principle from overseas territory ministers on these matters. Um, so he uh, met and uh, uh, took forward some um, uh, requests from overseas territories government uh, last year, I think in March of 2023, um, a member for Bogdan Regis um, uh, met the uh, chief minister in St Helena to talk about some of the um, 
uh, educational uh, assessment uh, provisions that we have in the UK and how we can share them abroad, and that was taken forward. So there's a sort of ministerial drumbeat uh, of meetings. In fact, I met very briefly the Education Minister in the British Virgin Islands on Friday, and meeting a number of them uh, later on today as well, where I'm sure we're talking about education matters as well. And forgive me, that's really good to hear that there's a, there's a positive drumbeat of ministerial engagement. But if an if a overseas territory government official or member has a concern, obviously in 2012, um, your department published a, an offer to overseas territories where it promised they'd be able to speak directly to the Department of Education. So whilst I understand the Foreign Office is the main body of connections, actually there should be a direct line for, in the Department of Education. Is that a phone line? Is there a dedicated email address? How do people in the OTs know who it is within the Department of Education that they can reach and how to do so directly without having to go through the Foreign Office? There is a direct way to contact officials in the department. I'd have to check on the exact mechanism of contact for you. Um, but for example, they can come to us with, um, with questions for example, about that they contacted us about questions around eligibility for home fee status a while ago, and we made sure we had um, gave them um, very quick within the, the same uh, week, I think, um, maybe even in the same day, actually, thinking back on it, um, a response about eligibility rules and others. So there are ways to contact directly with DFE, and our officials will always respond there. Um, but it's probably fair to say that actually the officials do a lot of that engagement with the overseas territories as and well. So forgive me, is there a particular official within your department who has within their brief overseas territories? And if so, how many people within your department have? have that within their title or within their job description? In terms of how many in the actual job description, I'll have to help you. There's certainly an international sort of unit in DfE who work on um, a, a number of these, these questions, but I can find the exact figures for you in terms of how many have you know, overseas territory liaison, for example, in their titles. And forgive me, do you think it's right that they're put within the international directorate? Because obviously this is part of the British family, they're not foreign. And yes, this committee has a fundamental issue with the fact that it's the Foreign Office overhaul that holds the relationship, but that's where we are. And there has been significant improvements over the last five years, which is why most OTs have said they're happy for that to continue. But do you think it should be sat within the international, given how absolutely different the needs are? Or do you think there should be a specific OT team who have, not full-time necessarily, but who have responsibilities? I mean, I think the, the key thing, I think, to me is, is, is two things. One, you know, that direct level ministerial designated contact for overseas territories and that's me and that's why I would always accept every single meeting request from overseas territory colleagues and two actually about the, the sort of policy offering that we're giving them and I do think it's you know going back to some of those changes that we've talked about like the um, tuition fee loan change in 22-23 been a positive offer there so I do think that there is both good engagement at ministerial level there's certainly lots of official level through DFE and FCDO um, but ministerial level too has had a meeting with colleagues from overseas territories tonight to be talking about some of these issues no doubt so it feels to me like the um, ministerial level engagement is good the policy offering is good but of course we continue to take any representations they make to us very seriously and look at them as soon as they come in thank you uh, we're delighted to have the chair of the education committee here with us i'm going to turn to robin thank you very much i was just very interested in your point about the uh, honorable friend for bogan regis um, meeting with overseas territories ministers obviously i did that job of minister of schools uh, st uh, st standards for about nine months and i don't recall any engagement at that stage is this something which has been reallocated within the department in terms of a, a responsibility or is it something which is new as of 2023 when other commitments were made to the overseas territories? I, I'm, not, I'm not quite clear. It certainly wasn't happening during my time at the DfE. Um, I, I don't, I, um, the, the Prime Minister, of course, wrote to all departments asking for every department to have a designated OT um, uh, overseas territory uh, ministerial lead. Um, forgive me, I can't remember your exact um, period in DfE and who may have been responsible or not. I would have to check, but it was certainly... I know the Minister of State for Schools at the time um, was, um, was having regular meetings back in that sort of early period of 2023 when a number of requests came in mm. to look at a few different specific issues. And one of them was that assessment issue. There was another one around um, delivering curriculum support um, as well in, in one of the overseas territories and a few other requests as well. So um, it certainly happens that regular John beat. And certainly today, um, there is very clear departmental ministerial that, leads. That, that, that's welcome. And, and just in terms of the department's resources that it funds when it looks at things like the Educational Endowment Foundation, which obviously builds evidence of what works in education, but also thinking about Oak National Academy and um, opportunities like that, are those uh, made available to overseas territories for their education systems? Or is there any process of engagement and information sharing uh, around what um, the department is doing in that space? Um, well, in terms of the um, Education Endowment fund, f um, uh, f fund, I mean, yes, that's a hub for, for, for evidence to share um, 
uh, evidence internationally about education. Um, so that's certainly available to overseas territories. That information, of course, we want to do that. Um, it's a very fair challenge about how we're making sure that overseas territories are aware of the ability to access that and engage with that. Um, so we're happy to, to take away and, and uh, have a look at it. Thank you. And actually, particularly on note, it'd be great if you could write back that's a that's a really exceptional point and something that could easily be rolled out and made more available so that'd be great if you could write back to us on that um, and just very finally minister before i turn over to henry uh, can i ask when you first came into role which I, i'm aware was only a few months ago how soon within your time as minister did anyone mention the word overseas territory to you or was it only when this hearing perhaps or the first meeting request came through from an ot um, well, I, I think the honest answer is I had a huge amount of induction, like all ministers. In, 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 Luckily, um, you'll remember in, yours. Um, like. <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in the first uh, first couple of weeks, um, across a range of different issues, um, I think no doubt it will have come up in the early conversations that what, that this um, hearing was happening. I think it was probably um, established before I was even appointed, so I'm certain. Mm. Whether it came firstly because this this inquiry was happening, I can't quite remember. But there was certainly a case of you know lots of different briefings, including about you know international education matters too. So um, I can't remember the exact exact point but uh, certainly early on is, is, is if that's new reassurance thank you so much henry uh, thank you for being with us uh, today uh, the government's international development uh, white paper uh, stated that uh, the uk will be ambitious for the overseas territories as we are for the uk um, how do dft intend to promote coordination of the oda for education um, in the uh, british overseas territories yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to, th- there seems to be two really key points to me here in terms of ODA. You know, one is how much ODA is reaching the OTs is a, sort of, um, uh, year on year and what's the direction of travel in terms of how, how much is, is getting there. The second is how much of that ODA is actually spent on education, education-related matters when it does reach um, ODA-eligible um, uh, ter- overseas territories. I think on um, on both questions, there's a sort of reasonably positive story to tell in that the, the um, amount of ODA reaching um, territories is increasing. So if you look at uh, St Helena, that increased 4% this year. I think went up from 31.8 million to um, just over 33 million this year. Um, Pitcairn went up from uh, 28.4 to over 30 million. So the direction of travel is positive. The question underneath that then is sort of how much of that is actually getting to education-related matters. Um, it, it's almost sl- slightly more difficult to track than it would be in in this country, just because of the way that education spend is is um, is uh, checked, controlled. So you can track quite easily education and uh, spend on young people, um, and that um, is uh, I think also a reasonably positive story. If you look at so in St Helena, um, they were spending 6.9 percent of their overall recurrent budgets on education and young person support in 2021-22, uh, and that's forecast this year to be at 7.8%. So the direction of travel is, is broadly positive there too, um, and that's the, um, the, the same, I think, in uh, Montserrat, which was 7.7% in 22-23, and now uh, 8.5% this year. So it's a definitely a two-pronged challenge, making sure the support is getting there, and then when it is there, making sure it's being spent on or supporting the overseas territories when they make domestic decisions about spending it on education um, and helping to make sure it's spent in an effective way as well, which is clear, clearly crucial. Thank you, Minister. Perhaps a wider question uh, for the officials. Uh, last year, um, the FCDO um, announced that it would be um, coordinating a cross-departmental strategy uh, for the overseas territories. Can you provide us uh, with a status on how that strategy is um, developing, um, or how it has developed up to this point? Can I take this Please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so, yes, very happy to answer on the strategy. I'm um, fortunate to be responsible for the strategy um, in my uh, in my role. Um, so. Uh, uh, you're right to, to point out it was announced uh, last year. So, the uh, what really starts us off is actually the declaration. So, the joint declaration, which was uh, agreed at the November Joint Ministerial Council and published in December, sets out that combined vision, which was agreed by all of the leaders of the overseas territories and the UK, about what we want the future of our relationship to look like. And now, what the UK is doing at the moment is consulting on the strategy for the overseas territories. So that would be the UK strategy. The intention is to publish that this year, and uh, that will be about how the UK delivers on our part of that vision, as well as existing commitments and obligations to the territories. Um, the process is, at the moment, consultation uh, in person as much as possible. Um, 
the ministers asked my team to take the lead on that. I've been very fortunate to be able to go and visit as many territories as I possibly can, my team doing some of them as well, um, for uh, in-person meetings. The meetings are variable according to who the government in the territory wants us to see. Um, I'm really happy to be flexible according to make sure we listen to what the territory wants us to hear. I think that's right. Um, Minister Rutley is the lead minister for the overseas territories in UK government, is also uh, chairing meetings with the, with the leaders and the premiers of the territories uh, to hear from them directly, uh, update them about how all the consultations are going, key themes that are coming out, and then also hear from them directly. Um, the minister had a call last week and there'll be further calls ahead of the publication. And more specifically, um, coming to education, what aspirations um, are um, outlined in that strategy for education in the overseas territories? And I imagine that will vary or not, perhaps uh, depending on, on what overseas territory um, uh, is, it, it, it we're referring to. So, uh, it would be a little ahead, ahead of the game for me to set out what will be in the strategy specifically, I'm afraid, as it's still in development. Um, so FCDO is leading as, a, as the coordinating department, which is, which is our role uh, on overseas territories. So the Department for Education are certainly brought into the discussions on specifically what commitments on education there will be in the strategy. I think it's also important to say, though, that, uh, and as set out in the declaration, the intention is for uh, the UK to enter into bilateral partnership compacts. Um, so that would be between the UK and each individual territory. Um, this will be after the strategy is published. Uh, where that allows us to get into more specifics about what our shared priorities are and then what that territory can expect from the UK and vice versa. So that allows for some more specifics as well. No, thank you. Uh, when is the strategy um, aimed to be published? Uh, so it will be aimed to be published this year as, as soon as possible. Um, and then, uh, Minister, perhaps if I can um, turn uh, back to you uh, finally, what input is the Department for Education um, putting into that strategy? Can you give us any idea about what the sort of aspirations that DfE um, have, have for that strategy for the OTs? The, the consultation on the, the, the strategy itself um, is, is, is live now. I mean, I think the key thing is we want to make sure that when we, when we get to that point of having you know, individual agreements and priorities set with overseas territories that it reflects the challenges that they have. I mean, as the committee knows, there's quite a, quite a wide um, or diverse um, set of need, an educational need and educational priorities in the overseas territories. Um, what's required in some of the ODA eligible territories will be completely different challenges than some of the, um, than some of the others. So in some it may be more about infrastructure, capacity building, teacher support and training. Um, so there may be some different asks, but really we're kind of keen for some of those asks to be drawn out by the overseas territories themselves in the process. So it is going to depend on what comes, comes to us as part of the request, but you know, ultimately the place we want to get to is to support overseas territories to be able to deliver you know, strong, you know, locally driven um, education systems um, with good access to further education for people who, who want to take that route too. So um, it will be mainly locally driven, but of course that, those sort of key you know, goals and narratives from us we want, we want to, 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 to feed into the process. And just finally, Chair, if I may, um, will that strategy um, in terms of those educational aspirations for overseas territories uh, cover everything from nursery through to university, uh, uh, further in higher education? Um, or is there a particular focus on, say, primary and secondary? Or, or, or? So I think it's probably at this stage a little bit early to set out just because we're still in that sort of quite early consultation phase about the, the strategy itself. Um, but you know, our expectation and hope from DfE is that when we get to the point of publication, you know, we'll be talking about you know, mechanisms to help people deliver that narrative of you know, strong, locally robust education systems that help people um, access good quality education, good quality teaching, and good opportunities sort of onwards off from that. So sorry if that sounds a little bit vague, but, but it's just because of the stage of the process where we're at, where we're still um, in early consultation. Thank you very much. Two quick follow-ups. Becky, can I just ask you, obviously, when you were talking about the consulting on the strategy, it sounded like we're mainly engaging with premiers and governments. Now, there's only 272,000 people in all the OTs put together. That's less than half the population of Leicestershire. I would like to think that if we were writing a strategy on this scale, covering every single aspect of people's lives, that we would find the way to engage with the 600 and something thousand people of Leicestershire. So can you give me some sort of reassurance that we're not just relying on premiers and governors, not least when 27% of the population of OTs are under 24? So education 
English in particular, they will have strong views on, but more generally, this is a young population who will have strong aspirations for what they want for their futures. And we know that many of the governments do end up being family affairs or, you know, repeatedly runs in the, runs in the community, should we say. Yes, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> so the approach we're taking to the strategic consultation is very much driven by how the OT government would like us to engage. Mm. So the, the approach we've taken is, um, so it, I think I should step back a bit to actually mention the fact that there was a period of letter consultation over last summer. So this has been quite a process. So there were, there were letters shared between the Minister for the Overseas Territories, changed in the middle, um, with the Premiers and with the Governors, asking them for feedback. So two sets of letters that actually led us to the declaration to start with and gave us some starter points for the strategy consultation. This period of consultation, which we're doing in person as much as possible, some unfortunately remote, but in person as much as possible, the, the, who we meet and how we do it is being led by the governments themselves, the overseas territory governments. The governor's offices are in touch with the OT governments and they decide who we meet and how we speak to them. And that is really variable according to each uh, <coughs> territory. So when I visited St. Helena, um, there were some very uh, large meetings with um, members of the public invited, um, representing specific um, spe specialties and areas of expertise. Um, so a real diversity of views um, coming through from the consultation. So can I just perhaps use this opportunity to put in place my concern that that's the way we're going about this? I think look, if we were looking at you know the population of the whole of the UK, we'd be in a very different situation. I don't think it's too much to ask that even at the basics, an online survey that you know young people across the OTs could fit in, let alone all anyone from across the OTs. Um, so I think I would just say that given that we are not at the stages yet where you're putting pen to paper, um, that I feel very strongly, and I will consult with my committee thereafter, that really we should be given the opportunity to all 272,000 OT uh, citizens to have an opportunity to input their say into the future of their OTs. Um, go on, Robert, just, just a supplementary point on that, and it might be worth talking to the Office of the Children's Commissioner mm. to see if they can provide yes. advice on youth engagement um, and the, the way in which you can do that. I mean, she does a fantastic job of uh, driving engagement and the whole concept of no decision about us without us with young people uh, in the English system, and yes. uh, she may be able to provide some advice and support as to how that can be done with the OTs. And perhaps that phrase could be applied here, no decision without us. I mean, the reality is that this is one of the problems historically with our relationship with our OTs. They feel we in London, all their governments impose decisions on them, whereas we want this to be a family. So I'm sure there is a way in which the Foreign Office can find a way to uh, provide feedback. I mean, I, I myself, you know, with a very small team, unlike you guys, have like, been able to do service to 5,000 households and have over 700 responses back and analyse them within my IPSA limited budget. Um, so I would just encourage that. And then one final question before I turn to Fabian. Um, the Chagossian Support Fund is obviously all about how we support Chagossians within the UK. Um, but we do find that in particular, and obviously Henry will have far more expertise on this than I, um, that helping them adjust and adapt to uh, the UK in terms of making sure they're <coughs> engaged with education, additional support around education. Has the Department of Education at all engaged with Chagossian Support Fund? And if not, is that something you might be able to take away, Minister? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, Chair, but I'll have to take that away and come back to you in writing, if that's OK. That'd be real. Essentially, it's a big, big fund that has been completely underused, um, and we can't afford for it not to be used, because actually, Chagossians, we have a moral duty, our committee's been very clear on this, um, to better support them, actually, additional educational support and all the additional services um, that the Department of Education has within it, beyond education, might be a good place for that department to look at. Uh, Fabian, apologies. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, your department's most recent offer uh, to the occupation to the um, occup uh, occupied territories, gosh, you can tell, to the overseas territories was published in 2012. Um, I wondered why you'd not updated your offer to the territories in the last 12 years. I think the um, the, the policy offer definitely has changed in, in that period. If you look at the, um, uh, the the introduction of the tuition fee loan eligibility, that was a, a big change. Obviously, it's still early days about how that's setting in and how many people will take up that, that opportunity um, or in some of the changes for, for, of the um, scholarship schemes, for example, like the Turing scheme um, and the way that we deliver you know, ODA support and DFE engage with FCDO and others um, in, in that process. So um, I would say that we have got some sort of you know, positive policy changes coming forward. Um, and of course, as we've just heard about from an F, um, DCO perspective, FCDO perspective, the, the, the sort of reset of the relationship, if you like, with these um, uh, new agreements that will be coming forward are going to quite fundamentally change the agreements that we have with the overseas territory. So, you know, we have a forward process now, but I, I guess I would say that the policy 
um, offering has changed quite significantly. When was the last time that you consulted with any of the territories about how they can support education in their region? Well, um, we have um, different mechanisms for different overseas territories. So, for example, on the ODA, um, uh, eligible overseas territories, we have an annual delegation um, where we meet the chief ministers, education officials over there, and talk to them about the sorts of things that, that um, they want to see and policy challenges there. Um, there was officials there in, in March, just a March this year, just a um, few months, a uh, few, few weeks ago, talking to them about educational delivery. Um, say the same in the Falklands too. So the mechanisms slightly differ depending on the relationship with the country. Um, but on top of that, we have the bilateral meetings, the um, ministerial meetings as well, um, and the regular FCDO official-led engagement. So it, there is definitely an ongoing conversation that happens. Um, and as I say, some of these policy requests do get resolved through that mechanism, like the um, previous schools minister resolving some of these challenges that, uh, and questions that people brought forward. So um, that definitely is happening and change is happening. Um, but of course, we're always looking for a way to continue to improve that type of process. Thank you for that. I mean, a year ago, it was announced that there'd be a new joint ministerial group on uh, the overseas territories. It was to be formed with a representative from each government department. I wondered if you'd had a chance to attend uh, the ministerial group meeting yet for the overseas territories? No, there hasn't been one since I've oh, been appointed a few weeks ago, but I think okay. there's one happening tomorrow, so I think it's um, it's happening very, very <laughs> soon, so um, sadly we couldn't have aligned the timings, but, um, but, but no, <laughs> um, there is one happening, yeah, happening very soon, but um, I very much look forward to attending the next one. Do you know how many times the group's met since 2023? It meets four times a year. Okay. I do not know the sort of the, the dates of the first meeting, but, therefore the exact answer, but I'm sure yeah. we can... It's Foreign Office will be convening it. Yeah. Yes, my team run the Secretariat for the OCS Territories Ministerial Group. Um, I don't have the exact number of meetings off the top of my head. I don't want to, to say it wrong, but I'm happy to confirm how many times it's read. Now. But the next one you're convening is tomorrow? It is tomorrow. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, just quickly on this, I mean, I uh, declare some, something of an interest in this as I used to chair the Joint Ministerial Council for the Overseas Territories during Brexit and uh, sat alongside Lord Ahmed uh, in doing that uh, over a long period of time. I just wonder, ha has any learning been taken from um, the discussions that were had in that group? I mean, home fees status and the whole issue around tuition fees was definitely something that came up in that group on a number of occasions. Um, and, and how do we make sure that um, the, the new JMC... Uh, learns from uh, that, that previous one, which, which had some, some valuable, I think, discussions in this space. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think um, I could probably give you a full answer when I've attended my first one of them, um, but, but I think, I mean, certainly, you're right, some of these issues that have been, you know, um, uh, policy challenges or questions for a long time um, have come up in various different forums, which is the council that you um, served on, no, no doubt, um, uh, the, the one that's um, meeting tomorrow and others. Um, but I think the key thing is, you know, what's the policy changes and delivery that's flowing from that? Um, and like you picked up on some challenges on home fee status, which hopefully have since been resolved, um, uh, or, or pretty much resolved. Um, so, so I think the key thing is, you know, are those policy issues that are being raised in those forums being tackled and challenged? Um, I would argue that I hope in most cases that they are, but I'm sure there's complexity to all of them. Um, so I think on a policy level, it is, um, it is happening. May I just update you on the question you asked earlier about who was the lead when you were mm. in the department? Um, uh, and uh, it was the, my predecessor, the um, member for Harlow, um, and then the, um, his predecessor, uh, embarrassing, I can't remember his constituency, but um, the current uh, cabinet office minister. Okay. Um, so, so there have been them there since, since whilst you are at the department. Yeah, no, that's, that, 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 that is helpful to understand. I mean, all I'd say is obviously a lot of the policy, a lot of the leader of this does have relevance to the school space. Uh, and, and I guess having been engaged with that when I was at Dexu, it was then something of a surprise to sit in the school seat at the Department for Education and have no, no sight of it. So I think joining up across the department, making sure that people can fil fil filter it in the right way feels important. And I just wonder, within your own brief, one of the things we used to discuss um, at that forum is the um, horizon and and um, the impact on some of the overseas territories of potentially leaving or potentially being part of Horizon. Now that we are able to take part in it again, is there engagement going on with the overseas territories to talk about the opportunities of that and, and how they might fit, fit, fit into any bids and any joint working? 
Um, yes, ab absolutely, and through, mainly through the mechanisms that I was um, outlining earlier. I mean, the, the subject broadly of um, you know, access to higher education is clearly a really important one in the overseas territories. Um, there is just a range of different levels of types of support, of course, depending on which, um, depending on the level of overseas territory. There are some, what well, I referenced earlier, the Falkland Islands example, where there's quite substantial support for people to get financial support, for people to be able to access higher education. Um, and it, it is more limited, of course, in some of the other overseas territories. So, um, yes, through the types of you know, achieving schemes, um, maturing schemes, all, all of the scholarship schemes as well. Um, but there are, of course, other types of issues around um, you know, loan accessibility, including the one that we've resolved in 22 23, and um, the maintenance um, uh, challenges that have been raised as well. So, um, yes to your question, but of course, there's other ones that are probably um, raised e e e equally regularly as well. Yeah. And Becky, just I wonder if you had anything to add just in terms of the, the feed in from that previous JMC that existed um, and all the, the, this, this issue of engagement on, on research programmes in particular? I'm glad you asked me because I did want to clarify, and I appreciate it's unhelpful they're all called ministerial something or other. The Joint Ministerial Council still does exist. Uh, so, what, so the Joint Ministerial Council is the heads of uh, the overseas territories' governments, so governors as well as the elected leaders meeting with ministers from the UK government. Mm -hmm. That is um, usually chaired by the overseas territories' minister within the FCDO. And then depending on the topics which are jointly agreed between um, the UK and the territories, uh, we invite ministers from relevant departments to come and chair and speak to those discussions. So we've had all sorts of interesting detailed discussions at JMCs. Then there's separately the Overseas Territories Ministerial Group, which is UK government ministers, which is every single government department, because now we have a minister from each government department representing the OTs. So the way they, so they are separate, separate meetings. Um, specific discussions at JMC about um, research funding, I, uh, nothing comes to mind, I'm afraid, from my tenure. Um, that doesn't mean that it hasn't come up, uh, but I'm very happy to check and, on, on that for you. Thank you. And just before I go to Brendan, um, Becky, are you happy to write to us about the four uh, meetings of the Joint Ministerial Group that we hopefully have had with over the last year, um, just so we know how many have taken place? Yes, of course. Thank you. Brendan. Thank you, Chair. Um, can, can I ask you some, a number of questions about education in St Helena in particular? Um, first of all, your assessment of the state of education in St Helena in terms of available resources and opportunities exist for students to advance to tertiary education. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, th thank you for raising this issue. And I saw it was um, raised in the written evidence as well to the committee. Um, I think there are sort of four key strands of the work that, that we're doing in St Helena to support them. The first is financial support through ODIM. We talked about that a little bit, a little bit earlier. Um, there's a positive news story there in that the quantum is up and the amount they're spending on education is, is up. Um, the second is about, I think, training in peer-to-peer -peer support, so practitioner to practitioner. This is one of the requests that we have had, which is about making sure that we're providing resources to, to train and upskill uh, teachers in, in sort of different different um, parts of the work that they're doing. Um, we have uh, facilitated an arrangement through, uh, with uh, Hampshire County Council, so there's a sort of direct relationship between council officials and um, the, the uh, overseas territory government in St Helena, and there's different levels to that um, that sort of matching up program. So, for example, that we facilitated um, a sort of head teacher to head teacher relationship. So every head teacher in St Helena has a designated head teacher lead to speak to in Hampshire to talk about. Uh, educational challenges and the way they're approaching education and then sort of moving slightly further down the chain then there's a relationship between sort of, um, uh, educational leaders within schools and, and the government um, about how to deliver um, a curriculum um, so there's a sort of curriculum based bit of training as well there's also then training direct to the teachers um, and that looks I think particularly at literacy because there's some challenges there that have been requested help for around delivering literacy training um, and to improve the literacy scores on the island. Um, they've also requested, which they have never had now available, all of those resources offline as well, so they can all be accessed by you know, anybody at school level in St Helena to use those resources. There's also um, training available for teaching assistants as well as part of that arrangement with the council, so they can, uh, I think it's particularly based around um, how to provide inclusion support for special educational needs and disability students in St Helena um, and students with 
specific learning disorder as well and making sure they're integrated properly into the education system. Um, so, so there is, and, and that, that pin is focused most at um, primary and secondary level. So there's a sort of range of different support there and a peer-to-peer um, uh, capacity. The third strand of support with St Helena, I think, is the sort of infrastructure, you know, capital infrastructure support. So, for example, at the moment we're um, uh, j- just committed to fund one and a half million pounds of um, digital connectivity support. So, um, essentially, t- to make sure we've got good functioning internet because that's always been a been a challenge so they can access some of these teaching resources so there's the capital element um, and then there's the sort of you know, some of the issues we talked about earlier the direct bilateral support that we're providing to through those mechanisms so there's, there's a sort of um, a range of options available to them um, but I agree that the support there you know, is right that it's that that intense. Uh, for, further to that um, I mean it's good to hear that you have you know that uh, there is this peer-to-peer support, and you recognise that there's need. Special educational needs are being met. How how do you measure the success or otherwise of what you're doing? What, what, do you, what have you put in place that you could measure that? Well, there's a couple of different w- ways that um, I, I think it, it depends on what strand of the the, um, the support you're talking about. But for example, if you look at um, some of the way that we work with overseas territories on uh, ODA support. There are some KPIs in education. They're sort of locally driven, but we help them achieve them through you know, advice and, and guidance and support. So I think there's two main KPIs they look at. One is the um, uh, percentage of students who are achieving equivalent of 5A to C- GCSE. Um, and the second KPI they look at, I think, is the percentage of the sort of adequately trained um, workforce. I'm going to have to triple check on that one. Um, yeah, so that's right. So, so there are a couple of different KPIs that we use there. Um, and then, of course, we just continue to talk to them about how successful that's being. It's not the only example. So there are other ex- um, examples of, of that um, type of relationship. Anguilla has a similar relationship with the London Borough of Bromley. Um, and again, they're sort of evolving in their nature. So when they come to us with extra requests, we can try and facilitate them. Um, so there are some direct measurable ways like KPIs, and there are some, um, uh, and the you know, owner spending controls. And there are also some more sort of um, uh, ones that evolve as the asks evolve as well. And, and in terms of one of the big problems that we've heard is about finding and retaining suitably qualified teachers is there a programme actively seeking to address that? And if there is, what, what is that? Thank you, yeah. So, so, so there's, there's teachers that are, there's posts that are specially recruited through ODA, um, and I'm sure we can share the, the, the list of those. Um, but I think one of the big requests to us is, what can you do to help with, with training and peer-to-peer support particularly? And it's why we've started to set up those types of arrangements. Um, I, I don't believe we've got requests to sort of deepen those in the Helena example but of course we want to make sure that the more training they need and we're trying to evolve I think the key point I make is we're trying to evolve that package of peer-to-peer support as much as we can so you know whether it's a request for more offline support more SEND support um, more um, teacher training because you know making sure that all the teachers are at the standard that you know we, we, we want to support them to be as well um, so we, we evolve the package that comes through but overall I think particularly in terms of St Helena it's quite a comprehensive strong package of support but we recognize that there's a reason there's a reason why that's so and and just finally uh, from me the integrated security fund money <coughs> what did that go to pay for in terms of education in Ireland on St Helena yeah I would have to defer on, on the ISF fund um so far as I um, can recall uh, ISF funding hasn't specifically supported education in St Helena, we have a number of different uh, integrated security fund programmes um, that do support all the territories. I think the key difference with the ODA supported territories is that it's a quite a significant budgetary support through ODA, where there's a slightly different process compared to ISF funding. Um, as the Minister said, there's, there's quite a lot going on with the discussion on the KPIs, including those um, we call it technical, technical cooperation posts, which are funded through that budgetary support. I know in St Helena they do use those to fund teachers, so those can be paid at higher salaries, uh, for instance, in order to attract international talent. So ISF, um, there isn't a specific education-focused ISF programme in the territories. So just to be clear, so the ISF money could have been used but wasn't, is that fair to say? The uh, government decides what ISF programmes to focus on. Um, there is, for example, a justice programme, um, and uh, th- th- there is not one focused on education across any of the territories. 
but that ODA support does provide support um, for the ODA eligible territories, for, including for education. I should, sorry, I should clarify that ISF is funding, it's available to all the territories whether or not they're ODA eligible. Yep. Forgive me, Brendan. So the, the evidence we received from the Department of Education does say the ISF is being used. Uh, in St Helena, it's providing peer mentors to head teachers in St Helena. In Montserrat, it's providing teachers uh, to teach them how to work with people with SEN and disabilities. And Anguilla, it's providing funding from uh, the borough Bromley to help with early years provision. I apologise. I think that's my, my misunderstanding. I, I believe it's because it's it's that's enabling those... Um, the supports with the councils, um, so it's not necessarily specific education funding. It's uh, that. I'm, I'm sorry for, for misspeaking. It's enabling those partnerships with the councils on a wider basis. So those partnerships with councils do go beyond education. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions about the Falkland Islands in, partic in particular, and you will know, I'm sure that. Uh, there are no sixth forms or uh, colleges that teach uh, post-secondary. And I wondered if you could start by just outlining some of the challenges that uh, students in the Falklands face coming to the UK to study uh, for their A-levels. Sure. Um, for, um, well, one of the challenges that um, I think particularly students from the Falklands um, experience when coming here, for, well, particularly for higher education, is the challenge with um, uh, accessing the, um, the documentation in time for the, for the start of the academic year. So, for example, if you're you know, getting your grades and you're, the time between your, you know, getting your certificate of acceptance from an institution and then the start of the term is quite short. And so obtaining all the relevant documentation at that time is difficult. So I think the Falklands exa example is, is probably the most challenging in that respect for, for, for any overseas territory of, of, um, of trying to get that sorted. So, for example, if you were in the um, Falklands and you were um, uh, wanting to apply for your um, visa, you would have to send your documentation to New York. Um, that would have to go on a weekly flight, so the flights don't go every day. Um, the documentation then... Um, sits in in the New York visa office. Um, it sits there for the average of three weeks whilst the visa is being processed and approved, um, and then it has to wait for the next available flight back um, to, to get to the Falklands. That, that, that situation should actually improve um, with the introduction of e-visas, which will mean that um, they will still the, the the passports will still have to be sent over to the to New York. But rather than being scanned and then sitting in the office for three weeks or four weeks, whatever it might be, they're scanned and then sent back on the next available flight and um, whilst the visa is being processed. So that will mean it can go on the next flight back. So that could show three to four weeks off the process. So you know, there are definitely extra challenges for Falkland students trying to access education here. Um, and I, we hope that will help with that. Um, that's not to say there's not more to do. I mean, one of the things that I've asked officials to look at is whether we can... Um, communicate um, clearly to universities about um, flexibility with students from the Falkland Islands on courses where it might be appropriate. So there might be some courses where if you start you know, slightly late, it just it isn't possible for someone to come and catch up. But there may be some in different circumstances where it might be appropriate. So I'm just looking at ways that we can improve that situation because if you're, if you're in the Falklands and you're having to send your passport off, certainly this year you'll still have to, the visas will not be in place for this coming um, cohort of students so it, this will be the last cohort next year it will be in place but I particularly want to make sure that this year people that are finding themselves in that situation of having to send their documentation and waiting for that period of time at least we're doing all we can to make sure that where higher ed education institutions can be flexible then we're you know, um, supporting them to do so so there's, there's no d denial that there's an extra layer of challenge there Thank you Minister and I think that students who require the visa also have to Prove their English language capability, and that requires flying to Santiago in Chile to do their uh, UKVI IELTS exam. Uh, how are the Home Office and Department of Education working to see if there's a, a way around that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yes, you're right. There will be a small number of students. It will be a small number. I can get you the exact the exact breakdown of the figures that will have to fly and do an English language test. Um, it's probably worth saying that if you, you know, um, British overseas you know, nationals in the overseas territories, they won't have to take the test because they're you know, 
in part of English speaking um, <coughs> countries, so the designators being not having to take the test in the first place. But you're right, there will be a small number that will have to fly to Santiago. Of course, they have the same challenge with the weekly flights, so they have to get the flight out there. In the Falklands, that is um, funded by the, by the government there, um, and if someone's under 18, then it's funded for, the, for, for, for an adult or carer to go with them. But no doubt that doesn't alleviate the you know, concern and stress, no doubt, having to do that, um, do, do that trip. I think there is a, a balance here because um, uh, there are minimum requirements for English to make sure that both someone is a genuine student coming to study in the UK um, and that they um, are able to, to sort of properly partake in the course when, when they get here. So um, I do understand that, 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 that point. It, it is a, um, a small number of students. It's also worth saying that it's up to higher education providers themselves to look at the type of proof they want to make sure that someone meets the requirements for English speaking, um, uh, to, uh, to constitute English speaking. So there are different ways that they can commission that sort of um, testing. Mo to be fair, most of them do ask for that English test rather than some sort of online system. Um, but it is, it is a small number. And I think one of the things that I as well, as well, this comes back to that point that I, we do, I have asked officials to try and find some way to where it is appropriate and possible to make sure that HE providers are being flexible where they can. But again, I agree that um, it must be a, a stressful situation for those students. If I may, Dan, and just on that, so when we say it's a small number, we're looking at 10 to 20 people who have to go to Chile. That's an incredibly expensive flight. But also, just in general, the, the process... I would ask that you look, Minister, at giving a direct steer. There are very few colleges across the UK that support OT students to come to them. So we're not looking at writing to, you know, a massive blast out to every single school. But surely a directive can be given by the Department for Education that says, quite frankly, this is ridiculous. These students come from English-speaking countries that speak English first. There are all sorts of sub-languages, but English is the primary language that's spoken. And they've all studied it as a core subject. So frankly, I, I, you know, we don't ask that for people from Jersey. We don't ask it for people who are coming from any of our Crown dependencies. So why in the world do we ask it for people who speak English first, English at home, this is their main language? Surely a director can be given that if you are so insistent, schools, that you still want to test the English of these people who are British family, then at least you can do an online test. Surely that's something the Department of Education can commit to do. Um, so yeah, I'll bring you in a second. I mean... Uh... I, mean, I think, as I say, that there's a very delicate balance here. You're right, 10 to 20 is still a significant enough number that we should in no way dismiss the importance of a student having to be in that position and, and, and you know, take a, um, the week that, that it takes to go and do that because they have to be there for a week because of the flight pattern. And like I say, it is um, funded by the, the, the government over there, but that doesn't, doesn't denigrate the point in any way. And I think the balance here is about you know, getting the balance right between having a secure system, which means someone's a genuine student and um, can partake in the course, um, and the impact on, on the individual. Um, so I, I do understand the point. I do the English think test it's doesn't determine whether you are truly a student or not. The English test determines whether you can speak English well enough. And, you know, I, I went to an international sick form. I was very lucky. My local comp had an international sick form. We had quite a few people with some pretty strong variances in their English, but they got there from being there. But I, I do find it, it's frankly offensive to our OTs that we're saying to them that you have to prove your English is good enough for a whole week, which the OT has to fund, which, as we all know, their budgets are not significant. Surely there is a directive that can be given. You will do online tests only. And quite frankly, for OTs, you shouldn't be expecting to require it at all because these are English people speaking people from the British family. I bring yeah. Yeah. Can I just go on? Probably what's coming, because it's yeah. Home Office policy rather yeah. than DfE mm -hmm. policy in terms of the English language requirements for uh, the, the student route. So as, as, as the Minister highlighted, um, British Overseas Nationals um, uh, themselves uh, are um, uh, in effect counted as, as being from majority English-speaking countries, so they don't need to do an English language test. So we're talking about uh, the small number of the country nationals living in uh, the Falkland Islands who uh, want to come to the UK to study. So the same rules apply to them as um, uh, third country nationals from elsewhere in the world. And for the reasons that the Minister set out, this is about uh, ensuring the integrity of the uh, overall uh, student visa system. Um, you know, from a Home Office perspective, it, it, it's, it's almost impossible to tell whether someone's been studying in the Falkland Islands for a few weeks or for... Um, uh, all their all their lives. 
there are a whole bunch of other kind of flexibilities within um, the system. So if they happen to be from another majority English-speaking um, uh, country, as the Minister said, uh, universities themselves can choose if they're going to higher education, um, how they do that English language uh, testing. Um, and uh, there are some other flexibilities. So, for example, the test can be taken up to two years in advance. So if, if a student knows that they want to... Um, uh, come and study in the UK. Then and they don't have to go to Santiago if they have, you know, happen to be travelling elsewhere um, uh, in the world. They could also go and take the test there. So there's, there's kind of there's a there's kind of range of alternatives to them. But you know, as the Minister highlights, there, there are there are a number. Can of I things suggest. To I'm, I'm sorry. I still find that frankly offensive. This is the British family. This is not about third country nationals. This is about people who live on the Falklands, who have a right to live on the Falklands, have a permission to live on the Falklands. If we are, if the Home Office is that concerned about integrity, frankly, it'd be cheaper. It would say the Falklands government a lot of money which again comes a lot of it comes from the UK taxpayer if maybe if it's so easy to do it two years in advance the Home Office can fly out every two years and provide the test then it is preposterous that we have six, if you told me my six-year-old child had to fly to another country for a week and I was expected to allow them to be there surely I'd have to go with them as well in terms of safeguarding it is preposterous to talk about integrity when it comes to the Falkland Islands I mean I, this is a territory we went to war over you know, this is not you know, somewhere that we've suddenly decided is British in the last two weeks. I do not see how it is not possible to give a clear directive that the Home Office signs off that says if somebody from the Falklands wants to come and when it comes to the English language assessment, we're not asking about the rest of the visa requirements, we will leave that with you for today, but when it comes to English language, we as the Home Office accept that if they're coming from the Falklands Islands, they only have to do an online test and that's all the Home Office expects to see because why in the world the Home Office needs more than an online test? There's no justification, surely. Um, uh, probably a, a topic for a different committee, but we, we have in the past seen lots of issues with English language, the security of English language testing, which is why we have the system uh, we do right now. That's but why I'm saying an online test. But forgive me, how many people from the Falklands have failed the English test in the last five years? Uh, I, would, I, would not, uh, I would not know that. Um, any, does anyone know? How many people from the Falklands have seriously failed the test? might be a question for them to write on, if, if we, there are we, any people. Let's, let's write. I would love to know, for the last 30 years or however long we've required this ridiculous test that requires children to fly across an ocean for five days to seven days, how many have actually failed? Because this is absolute waste of taxpayers' money, whether it be Falklanders or whether it's the UK. And there is no question that children should be able to do an online test. These are children going into... We're trying to get them to further education. We're trying to make sure they can go for 16 to 18-year-olds for more education. We're not saying let them come in and I don't know, run, a, you know, run a company somewhere. We're saying let them go into more education where they could further their English even more. You know, this is very different to people coming here to work economically. It's about helping our children that we have a commitment and a requirement to do. So I'd be grateful, Minister, if you can make sure that we hear back, but also if you would take away that the Home Office should be able to come to an agreement with the Department of Education where you write and say an online test is all that's required for people to do further education. That is all we are asking for as a committee. I apologise, Dan. That's okay. Can I, if I follow on from that? So you can only get uh, a student from the Falklands or any other overseas territory could only get a visa to study at level three or above, so A-levels yes. or above. Now, the Falklands have said that that's limiting their capacity to develop a skilled workforce, and I'm wondering what the government's plan is uh, to uh, put that right and to make sure that students have access to vocational and skills training. Yeah, um, no, thank you. Um, and again, the, 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 not that it's any great, it's the importance of the point. The, the, the majority of um, the, the British um, nationals, of course, don't have that limitation because they, the, the British have territory passport, they can come and um, do those courses in the UK. Um, so again, this would be qu quite a, a small number. And I think one of the, one of the po points I'd make is that um, people coming to do that level of qualification are much less likely to travel abroad, abroad to do it. And often one of, the, one of the, um, uh, the, the, I guess, the more common challenge that, that I've heard in relation to FE is more about you know, building the infrastructure and capacity in the British Overseas Territories um, to make sure that they can deliver that on, on the islands, um, uh, whether that's you know, physical infrastructure capacity, digital capacity, you know, teaching capacity, um, because people are more likely to stay in the overseas territories to do it. Um, it doesn't denigrate the importance of the point, but um, 
uh, I think some of the things that we have done are quite positive, whether it's the example I cited about the digital investment in St Helena, £1.25 million to connect some of those schools, um, or um, St Helena Community College, which we funded, that is now um, delivering 300 different courses to people on the island there. So that's certainly the more common approach that we get, um, or certainly that I've heard so far, um, about you know, building infrastructure capacity um, on the islands themselves. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Robin. Thank you. Could you just give the committee the main reasons why overseas territories are treated differently to the Crown dependencies when it comes to support from the UK government uh, in education? Um, yes, uh, thank you. So, so the, the main um, uh, difference, I suppose, is, or the, sort of the one that's raised the most is that if you're from an overseas territory, you're eligible for the, uh, the fee loan f f from the UK government, um, whereas if you're in a Crown dependency, you're not eligible for the fee loan. You would be looking to your, the, the Crown dependency government um, in the same way that someone from the devolved administrations would be looking to their, um, their respective governments as well. Um, so they, they weren't included in that change back in 22, 23. Um, but if somebody, I think it's fair to say, and correct me if I get this wrong, but if you're a Crown dependency resident who is living and working in the UK, living in England, for example, then you would get access um, in the same way that you would with um, the devolved administration. So there are slightly different eligibility rules there. The eligibility works that way um, when it comes to the fee loans, but in terms of maintenance support, it's the opposite, isn't it? In that, in that fundamentally, Crown dependencies in Gibraltar are eligible for maintenance support, but the overseas territories more generally aren't. Um, why would that be the case when many of the overseas territories have a significantly lower income per capita than those, particularly those Crown dependencies. I think you know, the difference between St Helena and the Isle of Man is a factor of six. So, absolutely. Well, there's a range of different maintenance loan schemes available in the overseas territories. Is this the point you're making, that you know, essentially the, the difference in eligibility for maintenance loan? Yeah, so, uh, so, so, so Crown dependencies in Gibraltar are eligible for maintenance support, but ODA eligible uh, overseas territories are not, is my understanding. Uh, not by definition, but in practice, yes, I suppose. So, so for example, you're right, so that Gibraltar example I used earlier, um, you can get the £22,000 uh, grant, it's not even a loan action Gibraltar grant, per year to come and study in the UK, um, undergraduate or postgraduate. You're right, St Helena is probably the example where you hear the, the, the most about where students saying it's um, uh, people asking for for extra support there. Um, I did read the evidence by uh, Miss Peters and Miss Benjamin that were submitted to your committee mm. who were students who felt strongly about this and um, <laughs> understood the points that they made. Um, uh, there's a couple of things that's available in St Helena. So there's the, the maintenance loan, which was referenced in the evidence, the £5,000 a year loan. There's also some, there is some other maintenance support as well. So for example, last year in St Helena, the administration there um, distributed, well, it's not comparable, you're right, to the Falklands, but £10,000 between six students to help with sort of set-up <coughs> costs and flight costs. 2022, they gave maintenance just to a couple of students, and then 2023, I think they gave maintenance support to eight students. So um, you're right, there is an inherently different set of schemes mm. um, set up by the overseas territories. I mean, I think the overall principle is that you know, we want them to take decisions about how best to support students on their island, and they respond to some of the um, domestic pressures that they face. But I think you're right to highlight the St Helena example, which has come up, I've seen, more than most others. You've had representations to this committee, and also there's been other sort of domestically run campaigns about them as well. And, and, and I think, I mean, both with the St Helena example, and actually in written evidence that the committee has just received on the Cayman Islands as well, I think there's a feeling that what might be the intention... Um, is not necessarily translating to the practice. And, and actually, communication, both with students in those territories, but also with universities in the UK, uh, would be very helpful to ensure the intentions behind the government providing, for instance, home fee status and or maintenance support uh, are made clear and that these things work in practice for students. Because I think the Cayman Islands evidence is pretty clear that the intention has not yet been met in terms of practicalities. Is that perhaps something that the strategy for the overseas territories could help to address so in terms of the content of the strategy you're going to have to forgive me and say uh, but because it's still being developed um, but I can't c confirm the content but we're very much it's very much driven by what we hear in terms of consultation and it is going to be at quite a high level I think there's also the opportunity again of that the partnership compacts where there are specific challenges for specific territories to bring those up so where it is general, it might be appropriate to cover in the strategy. Uh, and I think perhaps I, I, 
I don't disagree at all that there are somewhat communication challenges around some some of the elements here. Um, I mean, you just have to look back at that you know home home fee status point where there was a number mm -hmm. of students who were um, wrongly denied home fee status that then had to go back and be retrospectively sorted mm -hmm. out and clarified. Um, we have since on that point resolved the cases, amended the guidance, amended the regulations. But I still want to make sure that all these issues we're taking from, from DFE, a proper belt and braces approach to making sure that the communication is right. On that particular point, I've asked the officials in DFE to go back <laughs> and have a look at is there anything else we can do in terms of particularly communication with universities, mm. particularly the ones that actually, um, you know, where these cases went wrong. And there was, there was about 10 of them, I think, but again, doesn't denigrate the point, to make sure that um, yeah, there is no one sort of slipping through the cracks in this respect and that the communication is right. So I've asked what more we can do there. Um, and I certainly want to make sure that if we're taking action there, we do it in advance of the next, the next cohort of students. And, and just on this subject as well, I mean, Gibraltar, I recall from my time doing JMCs on these issues, um, is unusual in having its own tertiary education institutions in this respect. One of their long-standing asks is to have home fee status for UK students to study in Gibraltar. Uh, are there conversations ongoing around that? Um, and are there any particular barriers to being able to deliver that? Um, <clears throat> yes, there have been a number of representations about, about this point, um, about, about Gibraltar. Um, they've, they've had sort of ongoing discussions with the department and the government about it. Um, following a number of those discussions, they have recently resubmitted a new sort of updated proposal. Um, so that's being looked at by officials in DfE now. Um, hasn't quite got to, to, to ministerial level yet, but I know that officials are working on it closely. Um, so you know, I'm sure when that progresses, we can get keep the, the, the committee updated about it. But I think it might have yeah. a little bit more ways. To well, I guess I'd say, you know, given this is an issue that's been around since even when I was at Dexy, which is quite a long time ago, um, it would be nice to see some progress on that when officials can put a proposal to ministers, because I think it, it strikes me as something which would be beneficial to UK students and beneficial to Gibraltar University. Um, but um, one last question, if I may, just um, one uh, overseas territory um, which has had its challenges, should we say, on the safeguarding front is the Pitcairn Islands. Obviously, it's a very small territory. It's a very, very long way away. Um, is there specific support, given the Foreign Office actually provided compensation and support to victims of child sexual abuse in the Pitcairn Islands uh, in, I think, 2008, is there any specific programme of work to support the smaller overseas territories with safeguarding? Um, I, I may have to defer on the exact <coughs> safeguarding point to, to to Becky. I mean, as you know, there's, there's the odour support in terms of direct financial and technical support um, that, 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 that delivered by, by the governments themselves in terms of safeguarding. I perhaps I have to defer to our CDO. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you. So um, in terms of safeguarding, uh, so I have a, a full-time safeguarding expert in my team who visits as many of the territories as she possibly can um, and supports them and discusses with them and provides her expert opinion. She is just one person, though excellent she is. Um, the further support on this dev devolved matter, um, but it is something we do try and prioritise, comes a lot through that uh, partnership approach that we've described with councils where they're able to provide support. Um, I know it's something that um, my colleague is looking at uh, building on in terms of seeking to get social workers out to territories. There are, of course, social workers out in territories, and there is a good exchange already. Uh, I've, I've met a few. Um, so social work support and training, as well as policy expertise. So, so this is absolutely an area of active work. But in, in the case of Pitcairn, given, I appreciate, it's a very small territory, it's very remote, um, but, 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 but would that be done you know, through uh, direct social worker support, or actually would that be better done through a partnership with New Zealand, with a country which, which they have more regular contact than perhaps the home nation? I'm afraid I can't give, uh, I don't have detail no. myself uh, off the top of my head about exactly what a partnership is with Pitcairn, but there, there aren't very many children in Pitka, and there's one 17-year-old um, who's just returned from full-time education on Pitcairn, and there aren't any young families at the moment. Okay, thank you. Brendan. Um, just very, very briefly, sort of further to Mr Walker's earlier point about the cost of supporting students into to, uh, tertiary education, in Hel St Helena, that cost is prohibitive, meaning that many students will be of held simply do not even attempt to, to sort of progress <coughs> to A level, even to A level. Is the government working, the UK government working with the government of St Helena to try and encourage more students to study to A level and also to make that access to tertiary education 
more accessible and more affordable for them? We're, thank you. I mean, we're certainly working with them on their priority of getting more money into the education system generally um, and supporting them with that infrastructure development. But I think the other things I would point to, I did read the written evidence about St Helene carefully, was the point I, I made earlier about the extra schemes that weren't mentioned in the, in the evidence, um, but also some of the scholarship schemes that are available to ODA countries too. So you've got the Shevening Scheme, the Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme, where students can, can apply to from St Helena, um, and uh, you know, we continue to engage with them on those annual delegations and through the you know, rolling ODA um, uh, uh, you know, programme to, to make sure that um, that money is being um, well spent and spent properly and supported in the right way. So between that sort of package of the domestic schemes they've got, loan, grant, evening scheme, Com uh, Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme, there is a good package there, but of course we'll work with them to make sure we can help them achieve their aims and education is a big part of that and so is access to HE. Okay, thank you. Uh, just three very brief ones. Um, one of the problems we have heard frequently is that, for example, if you are in St Helena and you want to access support um, for special educational needs from a UK resource, unless you have a British bank account, which obviously they don't, they cannot pay for access to expertise and courses and all sorts of things that we would, of course, want them to get access to. So they have to rely on, an individual might have to rely on ringing the St Helena rep to ask them to pay with their bank account here in the UK so that Senko back in St Helena can benefit from it. Is there anything we're doing to provide, perhaps it goes back to the ACORN discussion, provide a more centralised access of resources that people can access? So there's definitely that, that point that I spoke earlier about, about the the Hampshire example where they're supporting yeah. SEND training. Um, I mean, I think perhaps it does come back to another one of those points we were talking about earlier about making sure the, the information is, is available and, um, and that it's communicated properly that that resource is there. Um, it is a positive resource and it means that we're giving proper SEND training about both keeping SEND students in schools and, and making sure they're being included in the educational setting properly, um, but also um, training to teachers about how to um, 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 make the most of, of time in school for those people. So um, there is a support package there, but it, it's only a fair question about um, uh, local knowledge, you know, how accessible it might be. And so I'm sure that's an issue that we can continue to work on with, with St. Helena. Thank you. And then in terms of universities, how often, and is this something perhaps we could look at doing on a regular basis, do we take the time to explain to universities that these are not foreign students, these mm. are not international students, and that actually they will come with very specific needs, but actually in some ways they will come with more needs than many others who come from you know, a big state, big supervisor, lots of other things. Um, do you think we are doing enough to have that conversation with heads of universities? Well, this is exactly why that I want to do something before this next academic year about communicating this to universities. Um, so I think there's a couple of you know, things that we need to communicate clearly um, the, you know, one is that the, we clearly just need to say take a belt and brace belt and braces approach to that um, home fee status issue and I want to make sure that that's done before the start of the um, next academic year and before the next chance of students who are going to be going through that process um, and also this point around sort of understanding the specific flexibilities that students might need coming from the overseas territories so you know back to some of these points we were talking about earlier about you know, having to take um, having to take extra time to get your English language test or your visa back, for example, I, I, I want to make sure we're doing what we can to make sure higher education providers understand that there are a different set of circumstances here. So that's what I've asked officials to look at and to do something before the next the next application has rolled around. So I think the answer is there's always more to do in this space and there's always more to make people aware. Um, but I want to make sure we're taking some action before this next this next application. Perhaps you can write to us in September as to where you managed to get to with that. Um, sure because obviously we're very keen to help communicate that as well. Uh, and then my final question is really, and I don't really know what the answer is to this, but it, it's one perhaps for the strategy or the to look away at. We held a, a session with uh, young people from overseas territories who were here studying in the UK, some at further education, some at university, um, and it was really interesting hearing from them. But the amount of them who said to me, one or two of us will go for further education away from ROT to the UK to study, they said two or three more may go to the US or New Zealand, but really... We're talking about classes where it really is a handful, if we're lucky, of kids who are choosing to go on to further education. The majority said, look, we're just go I'm just going straight into training. There's apprenticeships, there's jobs. That's great. We want an overseas territories that are full of jobs, not employment opportunities. But one of the main ones that, that so many of our overseas territories rely on or is a fundamental economy, of course, is tourism. I did wonder whether, as an investment in the future of our overseas territories, 
we should be looking at some sort of vocational school that is centred or located somewhere in the Caribbean where people from across our overseas territory family can come to become experts in that sort of vocational area because it does seem that we're not investing as heavily in supporting apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are happening, but not with all the support and infrastructure that we've put in place here in the UK. So is there something we can do to create some sort of vocational college that is located within the region, which we support manifestly, so that young people can, if they want to go straight into work, that is good. You know, We want to shift away from this ridiculous idea that we all have to go to university but co-locating something in the region that can benefit, that is also bringing f first-class UK education, focus on that vocational. Maybe that's something the department could take away. Um, yeah, f thank you, and, and uh, very fair challenge. I mean, I think it comes back to that absolutely central point here, which is capacity building in the overseas territories. And you know, in the longer term, you know, coming back to the, sort of the first answer I gave at the start of the session, which is about this is you know, about making sure that we're investing in overseas territories so they have the ability themselves to deliver you know, world-class education like we would want to access, you know, we access here in this country. So you know, that, that is the challenge that, that, that I think we all need to be ambitious in setting, um, and that's why all of those policy interventions are important. And I say there are some examples of the, um, the, the, the type of um, uh, intervention you're talking about. Like I gave the example earlier about St Helena and the uh, community college there with 300 courses now, which we've um, helped to, to fund, and some other refurbishments. But I think your, your point is absolutely valid capacity building has to be completely central to the strategy of delivering good education and yes absolutely we need to fix some of the smaller issues around timetabling getting people to the courses right making sure there's right flexibilities making sure that there's proper maintenance schemes completely that goes without saying on top of that um, we need to make sure that capacity building is a is a is, is a key part of what we do Thank you. Well, I will say, Minister, there has been a significant increase in engagement uh, with the overseas territories, and that is very much acknowledged. Um, but I think also what we've heard today is that the issues within education are within our means to be able to correct. Uh, we're not looking for significant new uh, financial investments. We're looking at changing processes and correcting bureaucracy. Um, so I think we'll leave it on exactly the point you landed on, which is that we are one British family and there should be equal access for all, uh, no matter where you grow up uh, within our British family. So thank yeah. you ever so much, Minister. Thank you to you, Becky. Thank you, Philippa. Order, order. Yeah. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.